The road to what ultimately becomes the Browning High Power is actually a fairly long and convoluted one. The French immediately following the First World War, they come out of it recognizing that they had serious problems with handgun supply and effectiveness. So in 1921, the French say, okay, we want a new handgun and we want it to meet these very specific requirements. Like, you know, they say they want it chambered in the caliber capable of killing a man at 50 meters. They want it compact. They want it to have manual safety. Uh, this is a big one. They want it to have a magazine disconnect safety. And they want it to have a magazine capacity of at least 10 rounds. The man who was the primary driver of the project was a Belgian named Dioudonné Save, and he was an FN chief engineer, and he took the project and he worked with John Browning. He was, he was Browning's protege in Belgium. Save and Browning, uh, mostly Save, came up with a uh, double stack magazine that funneled the nine millimeter Luger cartridges to, to present them for entrance into the chamber of the gun. And that magazine was really at the heart of what made the high power so special at the time. The French military was looking for a, a nine millimeter gun that had high power, stopping power. And John Browning had sat down and actually worked out a new semi-automatic handgun that literally got around his own patents for the 1911 because as long as he had a licensed agreement with Colt to produce his 1911, he couldn't actually violate his own patent and adopt another gun around that to sell to other countries. There were aspects of the high power in which, you know, the great man himself had to puzzle over in order to <laughs> figure out how to uh, evade his own earlier brilliance in, in, in developing the 1911. And in so doing, he essentially simplified the concept of the short recoil self-loading pistol mechanism wherein the slide and the barrel travel together for a short distance before they are unlocked and the slide can continue rearward in order to extract and eject a, a cartridge and, and recock the hammer and then travel forward to strip a new cartridge from the magazine. So with the high power, you don't have the, the swinging link anymore of the 1911. You just simply have a, a kidney cut in the lug under the, under the chamber area of the barrel that impinges on a cross pin and then, so that as it comes back, it drops the back end of the barrel down and simply unhooks it from its locking recesses in the slide. The other problem in all of this is it becomes clear that the French don't actually know what they want. And so there are a couple of trials held in the 1920s. The French waffle on certain requirements of this pistol that they're supposedly going to replace all of their sidearms with, but it goes back and forth and very little is done in the 1920s. However, though little progresses on the trials front in the 1920s, there's another major event that happens. And in 1926, John Browning passes away. And so the design, the unfinished design at this point, is left in the hands of Dudonet Sav at FN. And Sav keeps tweaking this design and keeps working on it throughout the 1920s. And actually in 1928, Colt's patents on the 1911 expire. So Sav incorporates some of Browning's earlier design elements into this new pistol and continues refining it. Until 1934, he has a final version of this gun. In 1935, the Belgian army adopted this gun. It's kind of ironic that the, uh, the gun was originally designed uh, to fulfill a French need, but it's the Belgians, uh, the actual home of the uh, design and uh, early manufacture of the gun 
that adopted initially, whereas the French went with uh, their own model, 1935, and you know that's never been heard from again. Uh, but the uh, the Browning High Power literally still lives on today, and is one of the most manufactured semi-automatic handguns in the history of the world. Over 100 countries have adopted or used the Browning High Power in some manner uh, since its uh, initial uh, development and deployment with the, uh, the Belgian Army in 1935. Of course, during World War II, when the Germans overran uh, Belgium, and they took over the Fabrique Nationale plant. They turned it to their own nefarious purposes and called it the Pistol 640B, B standing for Belgish or Belgian. Um, you see lots and lots of high powers with uh, German Waffen amps on them and seen a number of pictures with, of German soldiers carrying them. Uh, interestingly enough, during World War II, the guns were also made f for the Allies uh, by Inglis uh, and in Canada. So it's interesting, people were shooting uh, at each other with high powers. And the um, English high power, which again is a superb pistol in its, uh, in its own right, was available in, in some different versions, uh, as were the regular high power. Some of them had fixed sights, some of, some of them had adjustable rear sights, some of them were able to be equipped with shoulder stocks. Uh, again, reliable, rugged pistol. So anytime there's a really good design, odds are somebody's gonna copy it. In particular, uh, one of the best-known copies was made by a company called FEG, and I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Uh, basically, it's a Hungarian company, and FEG stands for the Gun and Gas Appliance Factory of Budapest. How's that for a name for a gun? And they started making clones of the high power, uh, certainly in the 1970s, long before the Berlin Wall came down, and certainly not under license. What becomes increasingly clear is, like so many older designs, it's expensive to make a high power. And most of the tooling that is used to make the high power is old tooling. And it cannot be replaced easily. And to reinvest in the equipment necessary to maintain production of these guns in the modern era, given the relatively low number of sales in recent years, it was just not cost effective. And unfortunately, in 2017, that led to the cessation of high power production by FN. More recently, we get copies of the high power from Turkey. Turkey is uh, ascendant as a gun making nation right now. And whether it was initially licensed or not, there's a gun coming from Turkey made by TSAS called the Regent uh, that is a very nice rendition of the high power. And the Turks are doing something that the Belgians never really got into, and that's making the high power out of stainless steel. Uh, the other thing that, that's occurring is, you know, they're using modern coatings. Uh, so it's, it's kind of bringing the high power into the 21st century.